Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first Young Leaders Circle event of the fall. I'm Raihan Salam, president of the Manhattan Institute, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Chris Rufo, contributing editor at City Journal, documentary filmmaker, and director of the Discovery Institute Center on Wealth, Poverty, and Morality. Chris is a gifted storyteller who has a knack for finding and telling stories that legacy media ignores often because they know the stories Chris is reporting would unsettle their audiences and challenge their ideological convictions. But that hasn't stopped Chris, who has been tireless in his efforts to understand the roots of urban poverty and dysfunction. Chris has been on the ground in San Francisco, capturing in vivid detail one of the paradoxes of American life, why many of our richest and most economically successful cities are plagued by addiction and street homelessness. Today, Chris and I will discuss his thinking on San Francisco and his latest film, Chaos by the Bay. We'll also cover some of Chris's other recent work, including his reporting on the federal government's use of diversity training, which often incorporates some of the most controversial tenets of critical race theory. Throughout our conversation, we'd love for you to submit any questions you might have, and we'll be sure to get to as many of them as possible. Before jumping in, I'd also like to say a quick word about YLC programming going forward. In addition to our standard monthly events, we're planning on adding more book talks and virtual engagement opportunities with our speakers. And we're thinking hard about how we can facilitate meaningful interaction among members while we await the return of in-person events. All of us at MI are very excited for what's in store for YLC, and we're thrilled to kick it all off today with Chris Rufo. Chris, thanks very much for joining us. It's great to be with you. Chris, you didn't start out as an activist. You had a very successful career as a filmmaker covering the glories of traveling in Mongolia. Uh, you made an amazing, inspiring movie about Uyghur baseball players and, and another one about senior citizens who've embraced competitive sports. What is it that made you into the kind of activist reporting machine that you are right now? <laughs> well, you know, it's been, it's been a long journey. And I think um, uh, looking back, I started as a young person in my teenage years and then starting into college as a, a kind of committed uh, young man of the left and uh, was very much very progressive in my political orientation uh, and then kind of had a, a great disillusionment in my early 20s uh, as I was involved uh, on campus at uh, Georgetown on in kind of left wing uh, school politics and, uh, and and became disillusioned, became felt like, you know, fundamentally uh, the ideas stopped working and then there was just such a pervasive phoniness uh, to a lot of the kind of kind of elite left wing agitation on campus that r really kind of undermined my convictions. And, you know, I, I had thought maybe uh, getting into politics at that time and then set off on a different journey, spent the next decade uh, as a documentary filmmaker working for PBS, uh, sold a film to Netflix, uh, working for international TV and, uh, had a chance really to go out and explore and to, to, you know, visit dozens and dozens of countries, uh, to work in some of the most faraway places. And, and and meanwhile, kind of under the surface of my documentary filmmaking work, I was reassessing my own political ideas and, uh, and, and you know, kind of launched it headfirst into a, my own political education. And then slowly, founding myself, slowly found myself drifting towards the center and then a kind of libertarian phase. And now a, a more kind of, I like to think of as a more mature, mature conservative uh, kind of political base. And and I think, too, I, I became kind of aware um, as I was working in the filmmaking world uh, that there was also a dead end there. Uh, you know, documentary filmmaking is a very ideologically committed and ideologically uniform uh, space. And I felt like uh, the, the kind of ideas and interests that I had were, were really no longer fitting and, and transitioned to a writing, uh, starting to do some writing, political reporting and, uh, you know, and really City Journal at the Manhattan Institute was was the, the big kind of start that... Uh, set me on this path and working with the great editors there uh, that encouraged uh, this way of thinking. And, um, and I've started to, since then, merge the two, merge the storytelling and the filmmaking with that kind of uh, political essay work and reporting. Um, and uh, that's where I find myself today. Chris, at the risk of getting a little bit more personal here, I do want to note that, you know, YLC is a group of young urban professionals. These are people who, you know, have a range of different political beliefs, but they're committed to urban life. And you yourself are someone who spent many of your best years in Seattle, uh, you know, growing a family, uh, growing a business. And uh, if I recall correctly, there was a moment when you were thinking about getting involved in the political life of Seattle. 
Uh, and I'm just kind of curious, you know, can you share a bit about that experience and how that might have affected your worldview? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it. Um, I I was kind of really starting to study the issues of homelessness, addiction, mental illness, uh, because they were issues when we were living in the city of Seattle that were really unfolding all around us. And I really tried to unravel this paradox. How is it possible that Seattle and King County, if you kind of total the public and private expenditures, spend a billion dollars a year on homelessness for 12,000 people, uh, about $80,000 per person per year, uh, and yet the problem gets worse and worse and worse. And as I unraveled that kind of political paradox, I realized that the foundation was a, a kind of extra permissive and kind of pseudo compassionate political culture and political policy. And I, I very naively, at the at the encouragement of my neighbors and friends, uh, put my hat in the ring for a city council race, uh, thinking that you know we would have a robust exchange of policy ideas and maybe I could do some good for my neighborhood and my district and the people around me. And I I, I really you know just got knocked flat on my back. I had a rude introduction to kind of bare knuckled urban politics. Uh, and, and, and as soon as I started kind of contesting the, the dominant progressive ideology, uh, just kind of uh, was just blown away by a whirlwind of, of, of concerted efforts to attack me, attack my family, uh, both in the kind of above ground kind of policy debate, uh, which I welcomed and was happy to mix it up with folks. Uh, but then it got very personal. It was kind of uh, stalking, harassment, vandalism of my house, uh, tracking down where my kids go to school and posting threats around the actual school building. Uh, and, and at that moment, I was totally unprepared, totally naive, totally uh, kind of just blown back um, and, uh, uh, and immediately kind of got myself out of the political ring. Uh, um, but, but really kind of redoubled my conviction that there's something deeply wrong in the political culture of our biggest cities that are the kind of dominant knowledge and economic machines of the United States. And I, I, I kind of thought, wow, if this is happening to me and it was kind of a, a difficult experience, how can I, um, you know, keep kind of in this fight, but do it in a way that is more sophisticated and more effective. And I think that, um, you know, luckily I, I've had, I think, much more impact, much more um, and, and much more fun, frankly, um, kind of really attacking the ideological foundations, attacking it intellectually, attacking it through investigative reporting. Um, and uh, this kind of at the time felt like a curse uh, actually turned into a huge blessing and something that I'm uh, you know, very excited to keep pursuing. I know this is it's tough to try to inhabit the minds of other people, but what do you think it was that was the most inciting about your platform, about the ideas that you were introducing? What is it that infuriated people so much? Because you know, I've got to say, I've known you for a while. You just strike me as an incredibly decent, generous, compassionate person who's always willing to meet people halfway, at least when you're having a conversation, you're an open-minded person. So what is it that caused this rageful response? Yeah, I, I think it's a couple things, and 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 I appreciate you saying that because I, I really do try to be open with anyone that is is happy to do a discourse. I, I'm I'm familiar with the ideas on the left. I used to have those ideas, so I'm sympathetic to people and really understand why they think why they think. But what's emerged is something that is very different than the kind of progressive left of the past. We have a a really kind of militant, destructive. Uh, alliance that is uh, political in nature, the kind of democratic socialist organizations aligned with the kind of kind of black shirted street brawlers uh, of Antifa and others. And, you know, I, I learned very quickly, that those folks who are highly organized in the cities are not interested in a dialogue. And I, I think, you know, what went through their minds is that, you know, I, I released an ad at the beginning of this uh, campaign uh, as using my skills as a documentary filmmaker, uh, and it kind of went viral all over the city. And, people were finally thinking, wow, this could be the moment where things turn. Uh, and it got a lot of attention. And, and in the ad, I, I, I coined a phrase, um, you know, the activist class. And the idea was that the policies in the city of Seattle don't reflect the popular views of, of the inhabitants of the city, of voters. It's really been captured by the activist class uh, that has kind of captured our institutions. And, and I think framing it that way was both uh, kind of, you know, Kind of linguistically, really putting my finger on the problem, uh, but but I, from what I didn't know at the time is that the activist class really didn't like being called out in that way, and then from that moment it was this kind of you know kind of bizarre campaign against me, um, 
And, uh, and, and, you know, it was frankly, very tough, uh, very difficult, very difficult on my, on my family, very difficult on my friends at the time. But, um, but I think gave me a great education. Chris? Say again. Did it affect any of your friendships? Yeah, it strengthened my friendships, frankly, uh, with a lot of people, people who, you know, were really kind of uh, generous and offered their their support and protection and and, and help. Um, but, you know, then I, I think at, on the other side of the spectrum, it created this kind of bizarre dividing line where uh, some of the people I've worked with and become, had been friends with for a long time, um, you know, really felt like it was a moment that they had to choose political camps. Uh, so uh, kind of let go of some friends, made deeper relationships, and then you know, honestly, uh, after this experience, and I think this is really valuable to know for people that are listening that are in the kind of young professionals in these urban centers, one of the things that really was probably most valuable personally to me, um, I assembled a group of guys, men, uh, that were kind of philosophically aligned, and we started meeting monthly in these kind of private dinner sessions. And these were successful people in business and and tech and uh, lawyers and, and, and real estate that we had kind of the same orientation. We had a common bond, uh, but they felt like, oof, I can't really speak out at work. I can't speak out to anyone. I feel very isolated. And just having that bond of people was just like a renewal every month and, uh, and something that it's, you know, it, it was kind of fun. We felt like we had a, a bit of a secret society uh, of like-minded kind of uh, urban dissidents. And, uh, and that was really something that carried me through and continues to carry me through to this day. I wonder, uh, were there skills that you picked up over the course of your documentary film work that have informed your work as a reporter now? Because when you're covering homelessness in Seattle and San Francisco and other major cities, you know, you're not just doing this in a superficial way. You are really getting deeply involved. You're talking to a wide range of people, people that most of us never really have these kinds of in-depth conversations with. So I'm curious about the skills that you learned and how you're applying them now. Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of um, foundational for me. I think a couple skills are involved. You know, first um, is actually going out in the field. When you're making a documentary, you can't make a documentary uh, in a library. You actually have to go out and, and get a deep kind of long look, hard on the ground reporting. You have to be there in the moment when people are getting uh, people are getting buried, people are getting married, people are get, being born. Uh, you want to be at those kind of extreme moments in people's lives. So you know, looking at homelessness and addiction, it's like I have no problem kind of, uh, you know, calling the local jail and setting up and, and being, you know, face to face with people who are incarcerated uh, and observing details, looking into the story uh, or, you know, kind of showing up under a bridge at a kind of a drug encampment and trying to kind of gain access to the people's lives and, and, and observations and stories. So I think the on the ground reporting and the kind of fearlessly going out into the world is one. Uh, but then I think also you learn in the filmmaking world how to painstakingly craft a story and a narrative uh, that is character driven, that is evocative, that is uh, kind of um, uh, emerges from people's real experience. And I think in some of the essays that I produced for you at City Journal, uh, I, I really drew on those skills to try to give a human face to some of these policy challenges uh, and then try to kind of kind of really consciously craft a new vocabulary. Uh, because the vocabulary of the kind of, uh, you know, frankly, the the kind of the vocabulary of the entertainment left is very well developed, is very sophisticated, is very persuasive. And I think I've been able to kind of steal the knowledge uh, from that and trying to, you know, get out of the, the kind of rut of the 1980s kind of right vocabulary and try to to bring a kind of new moral language to, to, the, to the reporting that I'm doing. And I think that, you know, I like to hope at least that that extends the debate, uh, extends a kind of olive branch to people on the center. So if you're even maybe a disaffected or disenchanted liberal in San Francisco and you watch my film about San Francisco, you might say, uh, all right, this guy seems to be not really 100 percent on board. But but these things that he's saying make a lot of sense, this way of framing the issue. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the most important thing is really trying to um, to contest these ideas on the grounds of the ideological left, uh, because they've they've really kind of dominated the epistemology of, of the kind of modern city. And I, I think we need to try to take it back. Your observation about epistemology strikes me as really interesting. So I wonder, you know, if you were studying homelessness um, in a more scholarly distanced way, 
doing it by going to the library, as you, as you say, rather than doing this kind of on the ground reporting. What is it that you miss? Is it because the scholars, the social scientists that do this work typically, the journalists who typically cover this have such a strong ideological perspective that it blinkers them in some way, whereas when you're speaking to people directly, when it's unmediated by that, you're exposing things that you wouldn't otherwise get? Is that kind of what you've been finding? I think that's right. And I'll, I'll give you an example that illustrates that quite well. So I, I just finished a paper, you know, if, if you're in a big city and you have a homelessness problem, you've probably heard of housing first. Uh, it's this idea that uh, the solution to homelessness is to provide a permanent supportive housing kind of apartment units to the homeless uh, with no requirements to participate in drug treatment, uh, mental health treatment, job training, etc. Um, and and the social sciences, you know, they say we, we've solved homelessness. I mean, that was the rhetoric in 2014, 2015. We know how to solve homelessness. And then since then, we've, we've you know, spent, uh, you know, billions and billions of dollars on this program. And if you look at the scientific literature, you say, well, what do you mean you've solved homelessness? How does this actually work? And what they do is they reduce complex human experience to a single variable. It's a kind of rudimentary positivism. And the idea is that if you take someone off the streets and if the housing retention looks good, you've solved the problem. So housing first, you're providing a free housing unit to someone who in 75% in of cases has a severe drug addiction or a severe mental illness, uh, according to, to HMIS data. You're taking them off the street, you're putting them in a free apartment. It's kind of logical that you're gonna have high housing retention. There's no responsibilities, no requirements. You can kind of live the same uh, lifestyle that you were on the streets in a free apartment. And they're saying, well, we have 80% housing retention after one year or two years. So homelessness solved. The problem, though, is very, very simple. If you actually go to any of these apartment units, you realize that what they've done is they've transferred the pathologies on the streets and they become now pathologies in permanent supportive housing complexes. And the literature, if you dig below the top line surface, supports this 100%. The literature where they're saying this is a success actually says in almost all of the cases, of these permanent supportive housing units, housing first, doesn't do anything to reduce substance abuse, doesn't do anything to alleviate uh, psychiatric symptoms, and doesn't even actually lead to saving people's lives. In some studies, people who are, are, are given these permanent supportive housing units are actually more likely to die than people who are simply left on the streets. So you, you, you look at the literature in a kind of more 360 view, you, you kind of corroborate or, or, or kind of uh, challenge it by a kind of uh, kind of real on the ground reporting view of trying to see, hey, how does the literature match to the real experience? And then you have a totally different story that kind of blows up the preconceptions and the policy presuppositions uh, that dominate uh, our, our kind of modern policymaking. Tell us a bit about the origins of Chaos by the Bay. What is it that inclined you to make the film in the first place? What is it that surprised you the most as you were making it? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I had a, uh, a a kind of a generous uh, benefactor and said, hey, Chris, you've been doing great work on homelessness and addiction and mental illness. You've been writing these policy papers, but uh, we really want you to translate your research into a, a short film uh, and a series of short films, actually. I'm going to have another one coming out uh, uh, at the beginning of next month and then another one, you know, hopefully before the end of the year. But, you know, the film is something I've been covering from a distance, which is San Francisco homelessness, which I think is one of the cities that has the most challenging uh, populations. And I was really interested in this single statistic where um, San Francisco has about uh, uh, 4,000 people who suffer from what's called a, the perilous trifecta. They're simultaneously homeless, uh, have a severe drug addiction, and are severely mentally ill. And I mean, this is kind of what I think of as the deepest kind of public policy and social policy challenge uh, in American cities, all focused in this one kind of hardened uh, population. And I really wanted to look at, you know, what is it actually like on the streets? And, you know, and, and thinking, you know, I want to actually show people what an open air drug market that's run by Honduran cartels actually looks like in the day to day. So we set up shop in the, in the kind of most active open air drug market. You have dozens of drug dealers just brazenly dealing drugs on the, on, in broad daylight. Uh, and then you have this kind of community and economy and world that surrounds it. Uh, so I wanted to show that, which is uh, a little bit scary and a little bit dangerous sometimes, but that's a part of the fun of making a film. Uh, and I also wanted to show a kind of um, 
the political narrative. So I interviewed one of the kind of most progressive council members and, uh, and, and she laid it out. She says, you know, homelessness is caused by capitalism, by Republican greed, uh, and by the federal government, um, you know, disinvesting from housing as a human right, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I, I kind of patiently and politely dismantled some of those ideas in front of her and to her. And by the end of the conversation, she says, wow, that's great. I never heard of any of that stuff. Can you send me some of the papers you're referring to? Uh, so it was quite a, a kind of realization for me that a lot of people uh, uh, that kind of run the policy in these places are good hearted people, are very intelligent people, are compassionate people, but they don't even have access or awareness of a different way of thinking. Um, and, and then, you know, tried to get a lot of that complexity boiled down to 11 minutes. But um, I think what's cool is it really kind of struck off a conversation. There were people in San Francisco that denounced the film and people that celebrated the film. And, uh, and, and I think at the, at the end of the day, it at least kind of injected a, a moment of uh, kind of seed of doubt in the minds of people who, who just think unlimited compassion is the answer. Uh, and, and I think I show fairly clearly that uh, it's more complicated than that. You know that there are 4,000 people in San Francisco at any given time who are suffering from that trifecta. Uh, and there's a larger homeless population of about 18,000 or so people. The city of San Francisco is spending a vast amount. In the film, you cite $1 billion for 18,000 households. That's you know, $50,000, $55,000 know, per individual. Tell us a little bit about how that money gets from here to there. How is it that you're spending that much money with so little impact on that population? Yeah, so a, a couple things. One is that um, you know there's direct spending on homelessness, and then there's you know what I think could be quantified as indirect spending. So if you look at San Francisco uh, County Jail, about forty percent of the people who are arrested and 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 put in jail are in jail, incarcerated, are homeless. Uh, if you look at fire department, about a third of their time and resources are devoted to homelessness. If you look at the emergency psychiatric services, I think it's somewhere around two thirds. So every institution has these kind of hidden costs of homelessness because, you know, frankly, what we've done is that we've we've uh, you know we've kind of reduced the psychiatric capacity um, by uh, long term psychiatric bed capacity by somewhere between ninety four and ninety seven percent, and we've created what I call an invisible asylum. That is the street, which is people in tents on the street that are severely mentally ill. Uh, the jail cell, you know, again, 40% of the people that cycle in and out of San Francisco City County Jail are, are mentally ill. Uh, and then the, uh, the emergency psychiatric ward, which is, again, a much higher percentage. So we're kind of we're doing that, which I think is a, a, a huge human tragedy and a real cruel system. And then we're also spending money on homelessness, purportedly on homelessness directly, that is a huge sum that doesn't actually do anything to improve uh, human lives. And when you add together, you created a, a kind of what I think is cheekily called a homeless industrial complex, where the majority of that money, it's well north of a billion dollars a year in San Francisco, is kind of sucked up by the permanent bureaucracy that is both direct public expenditure, and then I think more insidiously, a kind of nonprofit class. Uh, that has really, uh, you know, kind of profited off the misery of people on the streets. And even if most of the actual frontline workers, I think, again, are compassionate and well-intentioned, um, they have these real perverse incentives where, where you know, uh, I, I think that the, the latest numbers on migration are well over half of the people, 40 to 50 percent plus of people in San Francisco, uh, became homeless somewhere else and then migrated into the city uh, because of its permissive policy regime. So, you have like this real nightmare where no matter how much money you're spending, uh, you're incentivizing kind of in migration of 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 kind of dense uh, kind of pathological um, phenomenon, and you you create an impossible situation where you dump more money in, uh, and you're seeing more and more problems uh, on the output. Can you tell us a bit about the different components of the homeless population? So you have this kind of single male component. You have a group of people who are uh, oftentimes kind of violent, severely mentally ill. But it does seem as though in a region like San Francisco, you all see this in Seattle, you know, you do have some family homelessness. You do have some people who have a very different profile. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the numbers, and again, I have to you know find my citations, but I think it's maybe about 20%-ish that are kind of family homelessness or, or what I think of as hard times homelessness. 
Uh, these are people that are independent, that are hardworking, that are that are kind of employed, that are stable, who encounter some catastrophic event, uh, whether it's a divorce or domestic violence or a medical issue or a lost job or or some kind of uh, some kind of kind of catastrophic event. And actually, to to the system's credit, the system is very very good at helping people in that bucket in helping people in that situation uh, because they don't want to be homeless. They don't want to be on the street. They don't have any underlying conditions that prevents them from getting back on their feet. And, and I think we should very much prioritize those folks in our systems. We do to the large extent, Seattle, San Francisco, LA are actually very good uh, to making sure that there are really no kids on the streets, no families on the streets. Um, but the kind of, the reason it works is because you have a high rate of compliance. Uh, if you're a father and you have two kids and let's say uh, your wife dies tragically and you lose a job or have a medical condition, you're going to do whatever it takes to keep your kids inside and get back on your feet. So uh, that in a way is the, the the kind of locus of greatest success, but also the kind of uh, easiest cases. So um, I, I, I it's like spare no expense. I mean, these are folks who who truly need a functioning safety net and uh, and it's a very different profile, a very different set of issues uh, than the kind of single uh, male 24 to 49 uh, that in 40 in 75 to 78 percent of the cases uh, is unsheltered addicted and mentally ill there's been a political transformation over the past decade decade and a half uh, all along the west coast you see it to some extent nationally in which there's been a sharp turn against what you know you might call law and order policies California was a great innovator on three strikes and you're out and much else in response to the crack epidemic and that massive crime wave. But now it seems as though the state has veered in this dramatically different direction where the idea of a punitive approach is stigmatized. Uh, and, and I wonder what you think about that. You know, Why are people so averse to the idea that if you are a persistent lawbreaker, if you are guilty of so-called petty crimes, we ought to take a more permissive approach. Is that part of what's kind of shaping this chaotic environment on the streets in San Francisco and other West Coast cities? A hundred percent, it is. And uh, I'll, I'll be actually in the next issue of City Journal. I'm I'm uh, I'm publishing a, a report on this movement in in the city of Seattle uh, using some kind of uh, leaked documents and public reporting, et cetera. Uh, and it, it really shows this effort at, at what I think of as deconstructing justice. And I think the important kind of background on this is that the real kind of what I think without much of an exaggeration, almost revolutionary progressive politics in our big cities has identified the criminal justice system, prosecutors' offices, jails, um, and, and, and kind of probation departments, et cetera, as really the last institution uh, it, over which they do not have control. It's seen as the last kind of vestige of conservatism, law and order, um, you know, in their terms, quote unquote, fascism. Uh, and and what they've done is they've made a concerted political effort to, to say, hey, we're going to run progressive prosecutors that decriminalize as much as we can. We're going to run uh, kind of to, to a campaign to shut down jails. They've shut down entire jails in San Francisco. Uh, they're now the county executive, a story that I broke, uh, in, in Seattle, in the King, Seattle King County, is trying to actually shut down uh, almost two thirds of the total jail capacity, um, and and then they're trying to kind of uh, curtail the power or even outright abolish uh, parts or all of the municipal court system, and it's all part of this kind of concerted effort to to kind of have a total control uh, and, and and kind of. The, the 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 rhetoric on the streets that is now being kind of supported uh, by the political class is that um, the the kind of criminal justice system is the only thing that is holding us back from ushering in kind of municipal utopia, uh, and I, I think that you know it's it's frightening, it's shocking, it, it goes against uh, all of the incredible kind of intellectual and and practical political progress that was made uh, under the broken windows theory. Um, and we're really throwing that out to usher in this new kind of kind of hyper progressive utopia. And the early results are not encouraging. The early results are a disaster. You have uh, a kind of uh, immediate kind of snapback of some of the crime disorder, public camping, drug consumption, homicide, shootings, uh, all of those things that were, uh, uh, you know, were kind of on the downtrend are now spiking back up. 
So you've documented the effect of this permissiveness, this highly ideological approach to public order in cities. You've also recently been doing some work on how this highly ideological perspective uh, is entering federal bureaucracies, specifically diversity and equity training that has its own kind of progressive utopianism behind it that is being imposed uh, literally in the workplace for people who work for the federal government. Can you tell us a bit about how that got on your radar in the first place? You know, it's obviously a pretty big departure from the kind of on the ground work you've been doing in cities. So how did that first come to your attention? Yeah, it, it kind of stumbled into this new reporting a bit backwards. I um, I had an anonymous tip uh, from a city of Seattle employee that, you know, that knew that if they went to the Seattle Times, they probably wouldn't get any traction. They said, hey, um, do a records request because the city of Seattle Office of Civil Rights is now uh, racially segregating their diversity training program. There is a training for white employees that's called um, Interrupting Whiteness and Internalized Racial Superiority. Um, that is now requiring employees to essentially like denounce themselves publicly in front of the group. And then there's a separate training for POCs, people of color. And so I filed a records request, uh, forgot about it. Two months later, I get the documents. It breaks into kind of a, 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 a explosive story that's now actually being investigated by the Department of Justice as a civil rights violation. And then I started getting leaks from all these other institutions. And I realized that uh, critical race theory, um, which is kind of this idea that uh, our constitution, our legal system, our, our social institutions are all uh, kind of um, a, a mask for kind of white supremacy and racial uh, uh, oppression, um, you know, that must be kind of deconstructed and dismantled and, and, and kind of re reconstructed along the lines of group identity um, uh, is at the heart of this. And it's actually kind of pervaded uh, everywhere from the kind of local school districts all over the country to the highest levels of the federal government. And, uh, some of these trainings are, are really horrific. And, you know, you and I talked earlier, it's like, I, I think diversity is great. Uh, I think inclusion is awesome. I think equality is, is paramount. Uh, but, but these trainings are not those things. Uh, these trainings are, are, are really insidious and toxic and, uh, and, and, and likely illegal, frankly, uh, because they constitute, you know, race-based harassment uh, and, and, and really revive some of the ugly, racial concepts of the 1910s and 1920s. Um, and uh, that's where it's going, yeah. Your reporting has already had an enormous impact, uh, including the fact that uh, your reporting on diversity training in the federal bureaucracy led to uh, a White House executive order pledging to unwind these trainings. But there's also been resistance from a number of employees within federal agencies that want to keep their diversity programming exactly, you know, kind of as had been the case prior to the executive order. What is your thought on this battle between the White House and this larger executive branch bureaucracy? What's going on there? I think it's a couple of things. One, I think, is that it, it might be some just bureaucratic inertia. Uh, people are resistant to change what they're doing, what they've scheduled, what they've planned. Uh, but I think, you know, and, and, and my kind of whistleblower sources uh, it, from multiple departments have, have, have told me this and kind of verified my suspicion is that, you know, critical race theory, uh, which is kind of identity politics grafted onto a Marxian oppressor oppressed dynamic, um, is the default ideology of the kind of technocratic class and the default ideology of the federal institutions. Uh, and it, it's kind of, you know, captured the minds uh, and the policies uh, within the institutions. And frankly, you know, they probably don't like the president. Uh, a lot of people don't. And I totally understand that. Um, and they're kind of saying, well, you know, no one is going to rat us out. No one is going to hold us accountable. We're just going to do it anyways. Um, and, and, and I think this is, you know, in one thing, it's like not a big deal, right? In one way, it's like, well, it's a diversity training and some department. It's like, ah, oh, blah, 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 who cares? But on principle, it's actually a huge deal. And uh, when you have a president of the United States that issues an explicit executive command uh, telling his, his kind of direct employees to do X, Y, Z, uh, they're obligated to do X, Y, Z. And actually refusing to do so uh, undermines our, our constitutional order. It undermines the kind of norms uh, that we need to have. And I think exposes a deep problem uh, that if we have a kind of administrative state uh, that feels like it can operate independently of the president who's duly elected. 
Um, we have a kind of fourth branch of government uh, that last time I checked the Constitution uh, didn't exist. And, and I think, you know, uh, some great scholars at Claremont Institute, our, our, our mutual friends, have talked uh, about the consequences of the kind of permanent administrative bureaucracy. Uh, and, and I think this story kind of neatly graphs onto two kind of uh, conservative uh, intellectual concerns. One is that uh, identity politics, group identity supplanting or kind of replacing uh, the kind of individual protection under the law uh, of the 14th Amendment and uh, the Civil Rights Act uh, is, a, is a danger. And then also the kind of structural permanent bureaucracy uh, uh, that is a, a kind of separate from the, the political power uh, is another big concern. Chris, we have a number of questions from the audience that I'd like to share with you. Uh, so one uh, is from David. Does there need to be more cultural censoriousness towards drugs and alcohol? Tyler Cowan has quipped that we should all be more like Mormons. Is he on something? I mean, you've seen the ravages of addiction on the street, and I wonder if you think that that would be uh, an appropriate response, culturally, if not from government. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, and 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 it's you know almost you know foreign to me. I, I feel like I I kind of for for most of my life, even my adult life, I was kind of more libertarian in my orientation. But I think having studied these issues over and over, I realized that if you are a kind of uh, let's say affluent, educated, sophisticated person, you can navigate a kind of libertarian policy and cultural regime effortlessly. You know. I, I, I probably, and, and maybe many of the people that are listening, are unlikely uh, to be kind of introduced to a social environment where it has a high rate of meth and heroin use. But for people who, for whom, you know, the circumstances of life put them into an environment where that's not the case, a kind of, kind of a libertarian policy regime or a kind of, um, you know, hyper progressive policy regime is something that is very dangerous and I think uh, very destructive. And I, I think, the idea about Mormons is right. I mean, you know, it's 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 by no mistake that you have uh, a kind of uh, actually very successful some very successful policies and programs uh, in the Mormon Church and and in all of my field reporting. Something that is uh, uh, that I've seen over and over and over that the most successful institutions uh, that get people out of addiction, that get people out of prostitution, that get people out of kind of a family breakdown, that get people out of these. Kind of these kind of nightmarish traps are faith-based organizations, and they're they're not just saying, "Hey, we're going to get you into cognitive behavioral therapy. We're going to get you a, a kind of suboxone prescription." They're actually saying, "This is the right way to do it. This is the wrong way to do it. We can show you a better way. We can transform your life." And I, I've just been blown away, and and and, at, and oftentimes reduced to tears uh, when you see someone that the system has given up on be renewed. You see, you see their mugshot uh, from maybe a year prior, this kind of face of despair. And then you see them looking at you straight in the eyes with this kind of a kind of physical renewal, a different human being. And then you ask, what got you there? And they say, you know, I joined this church. I joined this program. Uh, and, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Uh, and I, I think we need to kind of really push uh, uh, from the kind of policy perspective at these alternatives uh, that deliver human transformation uh, that I think lights up uh, uh, people's possibilities and, and certainly lights up me uh, as an observer. Christine asks, one gets the feeling that the next great crusade for urban social liberalism is the legalization of sex work. Does Chris agree that this is the next frontier for the activist class? What would be the impact of that policy change? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it. It. I, I think that's one of them for sure. I, I think sex work, uh, formerly known as prostitution, uh, it is a real kind of concern uh, in a real kind of movement that we're already seeing uh, decriminalized in San Francisco, decriminalized in Seattle. Uh, imagine L.A. if they haven't gotten there is next. Um, and, and and I think you know it is uh, it is probably going to end up as something that is uh, very destructive. And I think there's a kind of naivete where the people who are kind of managing, uh, you know, so-called sex work, uh, in many cases, are are are, are kind of a, a violent criminal enterprise. And there's a tremendous amount of abuse, trafficking, uh, a kind of underage uh, ac activity. And I don't think what we'll see is a kind of controlled, kind of Amsterdam red light district uh, that is, you know, for better or for worse. Um, Kind of regulated and and kind of uh, legalized and and kind of managed by kind of semi white white kind of above board uh, institutions. 
I think you're going to have a hybrid of kind of kind of officially illegal but uh, unofficially decriminalized. And you're going to have almost the worst of both worlds, uh, where you're going to have criminal enterprises that are running these and law enforcement will have no mechanism for shutting them down. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I really can't say exactly how it will turn out, but I certainly have my eye on it. Is that because you think that, you know, whereas in some countries they have the administrative capacity and they're willing to impose the kind of stringent regulations you need to keep legal sex work reasonably safe, you just don't think that's what you'd actually get in U.S. cities. Instead, you'd get this kind of chaotic approach. Yeah, from what I understand, and again, my knowledge is kind of cursory, but in Amsterdam, you might have... Uh, you might have kind of, you know, storefronts, you might have kind of uh, management, they're paying taxes, they have kind of STD testing and and, and regulations posted. I, I really don't know. Uh, but that's kind of my my impression of it from from what I read. Uh, but but you're not going to get that in the United States, you're going to get this kind of hodgepodge of, of, you know, it's decriminalized, but the economic structures are the same as they were before. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I've reported on this stuff. I've met a lot of people that are, you know, in, in involved in this. Um, it is an absolute nightmare uh, for women. Uh, it's an absolute nightmare uh, for kind of addiction and abuse, uh, mental illness uh, and kind of predation. And I think if you want to look at kind of in, in a kind of oppressed class, I think that you'd find it there. And I think that these are people who, who really need an avenue out and I'm afraid that this kind of decriminalization would actually keep people uh, trapped in. Diane asks, the activist class Chris speaks of is clearly a minority, even in the most liberal cities. How do they do such a good job of getting their preoccupations injected into the media and public conversation? Yeah, that's the that's the million dollar question. I'll, I'll give you an answer. Uh, you know, they're a minority, absolutely. Like it's probably, I don't know, 5% maybe that could be kind of defined as the activist class, maybe a little bit less. But, and, and if you look at the public polling data, it's actually really remarkable. They have a truly minority position where, you know, in, in California and in Seattle and Oregon, you have majorities, outright majorities of voters that want things like a, a, a ban on public homeless encampments, an outright ban. Uh, and yet, all these cities are going in the complete opposite direction. And you say, well, how is that possible? The people want this, but the activists want this and the activists get their way. I think it's what, you know, uh, uh, the author uh, Nassim Taleb calls the the kind of dictatorship of the intolerant minority. I think that's the kind of thing that he says, the in intellectual minority or kind of political minority. And, and you know, basically who's going to oppose these people? They're highly organized. They have a full-time infrastructure of activists and intellectuals and media and reporters. Uh, and they have kind of, you know, political muscle where they have it through the kind of political institutions in these cities where they can knock doors, they can drop flyers, they can, uh, they can put feet on the street for protests. And if there's any threat to their, their kind of uh, kind of largesse coming from from City Hall, they can immediately show up with 250 people in matching T-shirts um, to kind of bully the councils to doing what they want. And frankly, there's no opposition. Uh, you know, the the, the the business community is kind of uh, terrified. They're in, in, in at best a kind of feeble defensive crouch. Uh, there's no real moderate political factions that are organized in any meaningful way. And and essentially, they they run the show with no institutional counterbalance, no institutional opposition. And, and therefore, they can kind of just see how far they push. And in the last six months, what they've added is outright, you know, political violence and intimidation, where they're saying in Seattle, well, the Police Officers Guild is the kind of last institution that is that is opposing us. So we're going to go to their office and burn it down, even though we know people are inside. I mean, this is happening in an American city. And, they're, and the political class, you know, the, the police officer's guild, I interviewed him, him and it's going to come out in my upcoming short documentary. Um, he's like, where is everyone? I thought burning down the offices of your political opponents is outside the bounds of kind of American civil society and civil discourse. And yet nobody is coming to our defense. And, and that's the ball game. When it comes down to it, uh, they will literally burn down your office. Uh, to get what they want. And I think it's a very scary moment uh, in American politics. This feeds into a question from Hannah. It seems like the Pacific Northwest has a particularly unhealthy political culture. Uh, <laughs> among the left wing, the Antifa sensibility is overrepresented 
and there's also the white nationalist fringe on the right. How does Chris make sense of this regional dysfunction? Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, it it, it is it, there is a kind of kind of fringe movements on both sides, and you have them really playing into each other. And I, and I monitor this stuff, and and obviously uh, what goes without saying, I reject the kind of fringe and 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 extreme politics on the left, just as much as I resent uh, reject the extreme and fringe politics on the right. And and yet they're both here, and it's and it's it's almost like they they have a kind of symbiotic relationship where. One kind of, you know, kind of hard right group will say, we're going to march on the streets of Portland. And then the their kind of hard left mirror image counterparts will say, we're going to march against them. And then they have these weird, like, kind of like LARPing battles where they literally just fight each other in the streets. And they represent these kind of fringe groups, but they dominate the kind of media ecosystem. They dominate the kind of uh, con political consciousness uh, because they have this kind of uh, kind of clash. And and I, I think it's, you know, I, I really uh, I really think it's something uh, quite destructive, quite frightening, and I think quite corrosive because um, institutionally the kind of progressive movement dominates these cities. And, and that's where I'm kind of focused on my critique. Um, but but it, the kind of right wing kind of violence and kind of caricature of some of these organizations gives the progressive a kind of out where they can say, well, it's just these bad, crazy people that oppose us. And, and in that way, they can kind of offload responsibility onto the president, onto Republicans nationally, onto the kind of uh, homegrown kind of right wing. And, and, and I think what we don't have is a real substantive uh, a debate on, on the substance and on the merits. And, uh, and I think that political dynamic is unfortunately uh, you know, part of that reason we don't have it. A question from Naomi. Why does Chris think the business community is so timid? In the age of Zoom and globalization, isn't capital more mobile than ever? Is it because they need college-educated talent? Are they less mobile than we think? Yeah, this is uh, this is gonna get me in, in in you know there's there's wide views, and I'll I'll just be kind of blunt with mine is that um, corporations by nature are cowardly, and what I mean by that is that they're risk averse more than anything uh, because. Corporations, especially tech companies in these big cities, are very, they're doing very well. They're very profitable. They have amazing talent. They have amazing business models. They're global in, in kind of scope and scale. So they're really not that concerned at what happens locally. It's kind of secondary to their kind of global ambitions, uh, which I think is good. We want innovation. We want these companies. Uh, you know, my, my wife works for one of these great companies. Uh, uh, and, and, but, they're risk averse and they know the territory. They know that if a Microsoft or an Amazon or a Google or a Facebook or a Twitter, if they come out and say, we are opposing, uh, you know, the, 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 the city government, we are opposing the progressive kind of uh, ideas on taxes or whatever, whatever, they're not going to do it because there's a huge price to pay and the risk is not worth it, uh, both internally and externally to the corporation. And therefore what they've done is they've adopted a policy that I, I think is essentially kind of uh, complying on social issues and fighting under the surface on economic issues where they'll say, Oh yeah, well, we agree with you. You know, we'll, 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 you know, we'll essentially in some cases, the companies are literally saying, we understand the rage of the streets and we understand why they are literally burning down our buildings uh, during the initial parts of the riots. And we're going to do more to, to comply with these kind of social justice mandates, X, Y, and Z. Because a burned down building for a major corporation is not really a big deal to their bottom line. A burned down building is a huge deal for a small family business. Uh, so there is a kind of asymmetry of risk and an asymmetry of damage. And then companies, I think what you're seeing now is they're saying, oh, we're not going to fight the culture war. We, we can't do that. That's, that's kind of a huge downside risk. But if the taxes start coming in, if the kind of quality of life starts declining, and if the kind of, kind of, kind of, loony political class in these cities starts to really going after our bottom line. As you suggest, the questioner, we're going to kind of disperse our workforce. We're already seeing that, you know, Amazon has announced they're moving 10,000 employees at least out of the city of Seattle. That's more than likely. Um, and they're just going to take the path of least resistance. And I, I, in my- So it's not a frontal attack. It's not actually confronting the forces of disorder. It's just paying lip service to them and then actually abandoning the city in the background. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that they're going to pay kind of lip service and kind of uh, kind of uh, meet the kind of almost extortionary demands of activists by contributing to 
kind of the, the kind of social pro, socially progressive or social libertarian causes which are popular uh, but they are very kind of uh, economically uh, kind of libertarian and economically conservative in a way and they are behind the scenes going to protect their interests there they're going to distribute their risk so that the companies aren't uh, kind of predominantly focused in, in issues in, in places where they have economic risk. They're going to distribute their risk uh, and they're going to kind of fight behind the scenes uh, to, to on economic issues. So, you know, you, you have this kind of uncomfortable alliance uh, that is corporate power. And, and this is something I haven't reported on extensively, but I really am interested in, in diving in deeper uh, because I think it's a very, very important issue in my sense, both in New York, in Seattle and San Francisco, is that we're going to start to see a lot of movement in the next six to 12 months that were kind of motivated kind of tectonically by politics, uh, but then accelerated, uh, uh, you know, maybe 10 X uh, by COVID and the kind of ease and facilitation of kind of zoom meetings like we're doing today. <laughs> Chris, uh, I know your time is limited. So just a couple more questions uh, and here we're going to pivot to homelessness. Uh, Tell us about the role that large mental institutions might play in treating the severely mentally ill or homeless. This is a question from Emily. Uh, you know, do you believe that a more paternalistic approach might actually do some good? Or is the problem that because the reputation of these large institutions from you know, the, the kind of mid-century era is so negative that you can never actually go back to that as a solution? Yeah, I, I mean, you can never go backwards. You don't want to just replicate the kind of asylum of 1950, but we need to have kind of modern uh, state hospitals. And, uh, and and for many people, that's kind of like a third rail. But the more I've looked into it, the more I, I, I think it's necessary. And I'll give you some context. You know, emptying out the mental institutions, mental hospitals, psychiatric hospitals, state hospitals is a bipartisan, has been a bipartisan trend for the last 50 years. It started with JFK. Uh, in I believe 1965, and it's continued up into this day. And and since the high water mark, um, we've reduced our long-term state psychiatric bed capacity per capita by something something between 95 and 97 percent. So we have somewhere between five and three percent of the capacity that we did per capita as we did in 1955. And as I mentioned earlier, we've created an invisible asylum of jail cells, homeless encampments. Uh, and and and, and short-term psychiatric triage, and this is you know done and has was done in the name of compassion, but I I think is enormously cruel and really condemns people who are suffering uh, uh, through no fault of their own to a life of misery, a life of pain, a, a life of indignity, and a life uh, that will end in early death. And I think there's a, a great bipartisan momentum actually leading the way here where I am in Washington State, where we have. Republicans and Democrats coming together in the last five years and saying, Republicans are saying, hey, this is something that's worth spending money on. We're going to actually totally be, be, be kind of in support of even raising revenues to pay for it. And Democrats realizing, you know, we went too far uh, with kind of this uh, kind of you have a right, you have a civil right to be uh, mentally ill and living on the streets. Uh, so there's this kind of kind of beautiful bipartisan moment and movement that is starting to emerge in state legislatures uh, that I think is a, is a huge issue and I think is, a, is, is really one of the key moral issues of our time because you can't look at someone that is a schizophrenic, um, addicted to meth, living under a bridge and say, you know, this is the system that, that we really need. It reflects our highest values. Uh, and, and I think that um, we, we need change and, and we need to build up the state hospital capacity and the ability to, um, you know, it is an unpopular word. We need to build up kind of the capacity of coercion. Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, that's that's really what we need for those extreme cases in order to help those families, help those people. And so you're cautiously optimistic that the policy conversation is moving in that direction. I, yeah, I, I, I'm not. Even, I mean, I, I'm not even cautiously. I'm optimistic. I, I'm, you know, this is one of the few places I'm pessimistic in so many areas on these issues. Like it's like it's like a trail of of of, of despairs. But on this issue, I'm very optimistic. You have people even in even in San Francisco City, the state legislator, uh, calling for a, a bit more of a conservatorship model. Uh, in the city, San Francisco City politics, they're actually doing some really good work on mental health reform. And then, you know, conservative legislators from small towns in interior California, interior Oregon, interior Washington state that are very conservative that are saying, you know what, 
Um, I'm seeing people suffering on the streets of Spokane, Washington. We need to do something. Let's work together uh, to rebuild our capacity. And uh, I, I, I'm very excited. And, and you know, and, and again, you know, Manhattan Institute has done some great work with DJ Jaffe, who I believe just passed away, uh, and, and others that are really been kind of fighting this fight for years. And that foundational work uh, is starting to pay off. One last question for you, Chris. Uh, the chaos that we're seeing on the streets of Seattle and, and other major American cities, what is it that we as citizens can do to push back against it? What is it that you'd recommend that we do to kind of turn the tide uh, in this fight against chaos? You know, you can you, you do whatever you can. And I think that the, the key value that I, I that I think is 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 needed is courage. And it's courage to speak out. It's courage to speak your mind. It's courage to say no. Uh, it's courage to put out an alternative viewpoint. It's 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 all of those things. And and what I would say for people who are just individuals, uh, go as far as you can. Uh, you may not be able to kind of go out there and fight the fight in public, uh, but contribute to an organization that does. Uh, you may not be wanting to kind of blow the whistle uh, against an institution that is doing something wrong, but send the documents to a reporter who will, uh, and then try to create at least in whatever way you can and you feel. Uh, like you're able uh, to push back against some of the destructive ideas that are driving this, because uh, I think we need to have a kind of moral clarity and a kind of moral certainty uh, that that the policies that are in place now are hurting people and are cruel in practice, and we need to have the kind of conviction uh, that 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 really communicates to people uh, that we have a better opportunity, a better way, a better path, uh, and, and I think that that's all that matters and. Um, it can start in a very small way um, and, and then uh, hopefully uh, a, a very big way uh, in, in due time. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today and speaking with our audience. We have many more questions, but I also hope that we're gonna have more bites of the apple, more opportunities to speak with you. Your reporting for City Journal has been absolutely indispensable. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us for your time and your excellent questions. For those in the audience who are not YLC members and who are interested in joining, uh, please take a look at the link on your screen. Thank you, everyone. See you all soon. Thank you.